the Sentinel card broadcast 33, a shooting. Off to Rotor Wall, bag number 734, held up, shot, and robbed by two men who escaped in the Hudson Coast. License number unknown. That's all. Rolls and quests. gentlemen, you have heard the maxim, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. This is just a little more classical way of saying a slang phrase that was current some years ago. Show me, I'm from Missouri. The modern man is a practical man. He wants proof. And when he gets proof, he is sensible enough to accept it. The Rio Grande Oil Company makes no extravagant or exaggerated claims. They state simple facts. Listen. One, Rio Grande cracked gasoline is made by the most efficient process known to the oil industry, the cracking process. Two, to this cracked gasoline, tetraethyl lead is added. Three, this gasoline averages 10 points higher in natural anti-knock rating than gasoline that are not cracked. Is it any wonder that Rio Grande cracked? is demanded by police cars, fire engines, and other emergency equipment here in the great southwest. Is it any wonder that more and more motorists are swinging to crack? Consider the facts before you buy. Remember that you get police car performance at no extra cost with Rio Grande cracks in your tank. For dependable lubrication during the summer months, why not try Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline motor oil? These famous oils are extra refined and therefore have longer life. You are guaranteed against substitution because they are sold only in tamper-proof extra major cans. Give either Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline a fair trial. They cost no more than most bulk oils. Now, Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department has sent as his personal representative this evening, Inspector F.T. Hawtrey, who has a personal message for you. Inspector Hawtrey. Good evening, friends. The modus operandi, which is known in police parlance as the method of operation of criminals, is one of the most recent police systems for running down criminals. It is a highly efficient efficient department of the Bureau of Records and Identification, your police department maintains files on every type of crime and every type of criminal, so that even the most inexperienced can quickly and effectively go through the catalog files and determine what criminal or gang of criminals may be playing in a particular part of the city and committing particular crimes. This system went into effect in the Los Angeles Police Department 11 years ago. It is rapidly reaching a state of per- perfection. The story we bring to you tonight is of particular interest because it explains in story form how certain types of criminals follow certain criminals' pursuits. In all of these programs, it is the desire of the Chief of Police, James E. Davis, to educate the general public in little-known facts concerning the intricate operation of this, one of the greatest law enforcement agencies in the United States. We believe that programs such as these are of tremendous benefit in inspiring public confidence, and Chief Davis will appreciate an expression of public reaction to it. I get a big kick out of that Dolores Del Rio. Oh, she... You swell all right. 
I like to have date with her <laughs> some night, eh? That's just you that will say. Up. My dear, you have to go up quick. Well, I walk back to that building and be quiet or I'll blow your head off. Yeah, let's see what you got on you. Hmm. Sixteen bucks. And a watch. Hey, you there. Who? Who, me? Yeah, you. Fork over. Here you are. Eleven bucks, huh? And a couple of pikers you guys are. Got a watch? Uh, yeah. Give it to me. Here you are. Good. Now, if you guys know what's good for you, you'll keep your mouth shut and stay right there for six, three minutes. About. You know what I'm talking about. I know you've been collecting the day's receipts for the Serbian gas stations, and I know you got the take in that briefcase. Oh, well, well, what of it? See this gas? That's what of it. Give me that bag. Why, look here. Give I'm... it to me, or I'll push daylight through you. Okay, Jack, let's go. Well,
such are the crimes committed by a daring pair of bandits during the latter part of 1926 and the early months of 1927. Descriptions furnished by victims are meager. The bandits seem to be about 24 years old, about 5 feet 10 or 11 inches tall, both Americans, both dark-haired. There is little for the police to go on. These crusty criminals are careful not to leave fingerprints, are careful to keep their identity guarded. Then one evening in early fall, patrolman Siebert Rodewald is walking his beat on Mariposa Street when he observes a couple of men changing a tire on a Hudson sedan. Another sedan of similar make is parked behind it. Rodewald approaches the two cars. Hello, boys. Having some trouble? Yeah. What seems to be the matter? Can't you see? we got a flat. Who's these cars belong to? Ah, so do you think? You don't need to get tough about it. Oh, yeah? Hey, let's see your registration card. Here's our registration card. No, mister, that's just a sample. The next one will go clean through you. Get into the car. Better get out of here quick, Jack. No telling me. Come on, copper, get in. Oh. You drive, Zeke. Keep stick on this mug of the rod. Okay. Now listen here, Bull. You keep your face down there and don't look at me, thing, or I'll bump you off. I ain't gonna have you identifying me and no show up. You better get his badge and his gas, Johnny. Okay. Don't mind if I frisk you, do you, pal? Just a matter of form in our business. Oh, I know. Shut up. I'm not gonna fool with you. I don't like cops, savvy? I just as soon plug you right now or sit on the seat beside you. bandits drive around the city with their victim stuffed in the corner of the back seat. They relieve him of his badge, his revolver, his belt, whistle and handcuffs. Finally, they drive up to the corner of 83rd and Van Ness Avenue in front of a partially finished house. Okay, copper. Get out. Take off your coat. Ah. Oh, you're bleeding in the arm. That's too bad. I'm sorry I didn't get you in the heart. Now walk straight ahead. End of this building, huh? This looks like a good place, Zeke. Looks okay to me. Okay, copper. Step up to them two of us. Put your arms out. Right up, boy. Now we'll show you how it feels to wear your bracelet. Ah. Now give me the other arm, like a good boy. Ah, that's just dandy. Now you can stay there until you bleed to death. The bandits fail to fasten the handcuffs securely, and Officer Rodewald manages to work his hand loose. Bleeding profusely, he makes his way to the nearest house and reports the shooting. Still, there is little positive identification. Then the next day, an abandoned Hudson coach is found in Long Beach. The upholstery is flooded with blood. And Officer Rodewald's cap, bearing the number 734, is on the floor. Howard Barlow, the police department fingerprint expert, searches the car for latent fingerprints discovers several, photographs them, and running them through his file for identification, he makes several astounding discoveries. He loses no time in reporting to Chief Davis. Well, Lieutenant, did you make anyone on those prints? Did I? I'll say I did, Chief. Jack Hawkins is one of them. Hawkins? Yeah. You remember I reported to you about ten days ago about identifying a latent print from one of those robbery jobs as belonging to Hawkins? Oh, yes. Yeah, of course I do. Well, Hawkins is an escape from the St. Louis County Jail. I got in touch with St. Louis, and they sent me his mug and prints, along with those of Zeke Hayes, the man he escaped with. And I've just identified two latent prints from that abandoned Hudson as belonging to Hayes and Hawkins. So uh, they're the boys we're after, eh? That's right, Chief. Why, look at those prints. More than 20 points of similarity. Here are the pictures and descriptions. That's great work, Lieutenant. Now that we know who we're after, I'm going to throw a traffic blockade all over this town. Men of this type must be made an example of. No one can shoot a police officer in Los Angeles and get away with it. Send my secretary in, will you, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. Keep walking, Miss Waller. Sir, uh, sit down, Miss Waller. Take this order. To all division and detective commanders. Beginning tonight and every other night until further notice, place a blockade at the important intersections in your district. Stop all cars and detain all suspicious characters. Arrest one Zeke Hayes, alias Robert N. Hayes, alias Robert Albert Williams, and one John Neville Hawkins, alias James Elmer Fox, alias John Neville Wright. 
Hayes is described as American, 30 years of age. Height, 5 feet 6 and a half inches. Weight, 165 pounds. Black hair, brown eyes. Hawkins, an American, 23 years old. Height, 5 feet 11 and a half inches. Weight, 170 pounds. Brown hair, brown eyes. Tomorrow's police bulletin will carry pictures of these men. But I want you to start looking for them at once. These men held up, shot, kidnapped, Officer Siebert Roadwald. I want you to bring them in. That'll be all. Get it out right away. Yes, sir. Night after night, citizens are conscious of the power and numbers of their police force as the traffic intersections swarm with uniformed officers scrutinizing the occupants of every automobile. But for all the efficiency of the police blockade, Hayes and Hawkins are not apprehended. The statewide teletype carries their descriptions to every police headquarters in California, and still the wily criminals escape detection. Although the men have not been placed in custody, Detectives Cato, Cahill, and Seeger prosecute their investigation and get from the victims positive identifications of Hayes and Hawkins as the robbers who held up the jewelry salesman, the gasoline station collector, the woman with the rings, and many other citizens. If caught, the two bandits are bound to go to prison for extreme terms on the basis of the case developed against them by the three hard-working detectives. But weeks go by, and nothing is heard or seen of Hayes and Hawkins. Then two jobs are pulled in San Francisco that resemble in techniques the work of the bandit pair. And a few days later... A wide-awake patrolman recognizes Hawkins on the street. He is brought into headquarters and fingerprinted. Listen, I tell you, you've got the wrong guy. i never done nothing wrong in my life. I'm going to dental school. I'm studying to be a dentist. Oh, yeah? Well, you may be studying to be a dentist in the daytime, but you've got a more profitable business at night. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then I'll tell you. You're John Neville Hawkins. And you're wanted both here and in Los Angeles for robbery. Uh, listen, that's all wrong, I tell you. Well, I don't think so. These fingerprints don't lie. Your Hawkins, all right. Did you see this, Inspector? What's that? It's a receipt for a water bill made out to Alfred Nelson at an address on Columbus Avenue. Alfred Nelson, eh? <laughs> Another alias, huh, Hawkins? Uh, listen, you're all wrong. Well, we'll see about that. Hold this man on suspicion of robbery, Frank, while I check on that address. <laughs> Officers go to the address on Columbus Avenue and find a veritable arsenal in Hawkins' apartment. Hoping to round up Hayes, too, they secrete themselves in the place. After several hours' wait, the second bandit arrives home to be met by the cold blue steel automatics of the police officers. See him up. We're police officers, huh? Hayes. Oh, well, you're caught up with me, huh? Yeah, and your pal, too. He's down to headquarters. Well, what's the beef? Oh, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon. What would you like? I'll talk to the chief about that. Hayes and Hawkins insist on an interview with Chief Dan O'Brien of the San Francisco Police Department. Finally, Chief O'Brien grants the request. Now look here, Chief. What have you got on us? A couple of robbery jobs. Nice one. Well, we'd never have worked your town if that blockade down in L.A. hadn't been so tough. What did you boys want to talk to me for? Well, if you send us up, they can't bring us back from the big house to face that beef in L.A., can they? I don't know. That's their business. But we'll don't put you away for robbery. We'll plead guilty if you send us up right away. I'm making no deals, boys. Yeah, but chief, there's three dicks down south that'll make it too hot for us. We want to go up for going. Go up quick. Yeah. And if we can ever get Cato, Cahill, and Seeger down there, are we going to do it? You're damn right we are. What do you got against these men? Plenty. They didn't have to build a case against us like they got. Well, forget it, Seek. That's water over the dam. How about it, Chief? Will you send us up? You're darn right I will. I don't know what all this chatter is about, but I do know I'm going to send you up pronto, even if you didn't want to go. are quickly sentenced to from five years to life in Fulton Penitentiary on one count of first-degree robbery. The officers in Los Angeles are furious at thus losing their game. 
I tell you, Cato, we got to get those men down here and try them for the crimes they committed in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, but how? Yeah, that's the question, how? Is there any way? If there is, I don't know. By the time they get out of Fulton on their prison sentence, the statute of limitations will have run out and we can't touch them. Well, we've got an assault with a deadly weapon charge on them. Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. What is it? We'll get the grand jury to indict them. What good that'll do? We can't get them out? Yes, we can. We'll subpoena them as witnesses in their own trial. Well, I never heard of anything like that before. Neither did I, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. Oh, it's worth a try at any rate. And so Hayes and Hawkins are subpoenaed as witnesses in their own trial. But when they arrive in Los Angeles... They insist on going before a grand jury. And in secret proceedings, Hayes testifies. You gentlemen are naturally interested in getting to the bottom of the crime wave that has been sweeping Los Angeles. It's your business to discover who is responsible for the open operations of criminals in this city. Well, it's a good thing you subpoenaed me and my partner as witnesses. When we get through, you'll realize we are witnesses. You'll realize that we aren't on trial, but that we are the star witnesses against the real criminals. The brains of the Los Angeles robbery ring are three police officers. Captain Cato, Captain Cahill, and acting Captain Seeger. Hayes' accusation explodes the grand jury like a bombshell. An investigation is ordered. And although the prosecution tries again and again to bring Hayes and Hawkins to trial in Superior Court, each attempt is met with an order of postponement to permit the grand jury more time in its investigation. News of the charges leaks out, and the three police officers are publicly suspected. In the meantime, Hayes and Hawkins, as guests of the county jail, hugely enjoy the trouble they are causing. Well, certainly fixing up those three dicks. Well, they won't have a... Find in this town when we're through with them. Yeah, but how long can it go on? Well, we can't prove anything. Watch out, that. This is better than Folsom, ain't it? We don't have no work to do here. Just lay around and smoke all day. So long as Ella keeps kicking in the little dough now and again, we're sitting on top of the world. She's a great kid, that gal of yours. You're telling me? There ain't many that would stick to a guy the way she has. A lot of good she is to you. You'll be an old lady before you're out on the street again. Yeah, I guess you're right. Sure, I'm right. What's more, I want to do something about it. What do you mean? I mean, I want to get out of this joint. Yeah, fat chance you have of doing that. Oh, I don't know about that. What are you talking about? Well, do you know old Tom, the trusty? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, he used to hang around Tony's in the old days. That's right. He's on the junk, you know. Yeah? Sure. And it's a cinch he ain't getting much in here. So? So I'll get Ella to hustle up some dough and promise it to old Tom if he'll pack us in a gap. Then what? Oh, do you know the way Cato and Seeger always sit in the front row in the courtroom? Yeah. Well, next time we go into court, we buff them off, see? And we make a dive for the elevator, go down the street instead of up to the jail, and we're out. Gee, that's a pretty big chance. Yeah, what of it? I'd rather take a chance like that than look through bars the rest of my life. Uh, okay. I'm with you. Hayes and Hawkins offer old Tom enough money to supply himself with plenty of cocaine if he'll get them a gun. Then on the next visiting day, Hayes whispers his plot through the screen to Ella in the visitor's room. Oh, Zeke, you're taking an awful chance. You know, what of it? Better than this, ain't it? Yes, I guess that's right. Now, look, honey, I want you to be in the courtroom when the bailiff brings us in. You nod your head up, Cato and Seeker are there, okay? Of course, there's no doubt about them being there. They always have been. Then when I start shooting, you wait until all the excitement is over before you leave. I'll meet you back at your apartment. Oh, I'm afraid for you. Ah, don't worry, babe. We're just seeing time, bro. Bye, honey. Oh, goodbye, Z. And be careful. Once more, the case of the people versus John Neville Hawkins and Zeke Hayes is called. Once more, as they had so many times before, Hayes and Hawkins are led into the courtroom and stand facing the judge. Once more, a movement is made for postponement. Your Honor, I move this case be postponed. Johnny, 
I was shaking her head. Hey, do I see Gardner in the courtroom? Oh, my God. What do we do now? They'll find that cat on us if we go back to jail with it. They're going to shoot our way out just the same. Right now? No, just as soon as they put us in the elevator. Okay. Do I hear any objections? Case is postponed until July 13th. You may take the prisoners back to their cells. All right, come on, you guys. Oh, we're coming. <laughs> You're lucky, guys, always getting your trial postponed. Yeah. Guess you sort of like a jail for this time, huh? Yeah, just love it. Here's the elevator. Let's go. Yeah, sir, gentlemen, going up. a boy, Sam, up to the jail. Okay, Johnny, let him have it. Hey, what the... Hey, drop that gun! Thank you, cop. Oh. Shoot my partner, will you? Oh. You hurt bad, Teddy? Uh, I'm all right. Well, you're bleeding. Get us downstairs, Sam. We've got to get Casey to the hospital. Yeah, but how about me? I'm here, too, and so's my pal. Oh, your pal's not here. He's dead. Look at him. Dead as a doornail. And that's the way I wish you was. Shooting my partner in the back, you rat! <laughs>
involving all cars is based on the confidential files of the Los Angeles Police Department and is written and produced by William N. Robeson. This is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs>